Hello, Cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. From his beloved film guides, books, and tenure on Entertainment Tonight, to his podcast, Malton on Movies, my guest Leonard Malton has been a part of my movie watching life for as long as I can remember. And he tells all in the fascinating new memoir, Starstruck, My Unlikely Road to Hollywood. We talked about Mr. Malton's life, career, and most treasured achievement. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mr. Malton. My pleasure. Now, in reading your book in the early chapters, I had to keep reminding myself that I was reading about a 13-year-old because this is not an age known for self-confidence, and you're out there kind of networking like a young executive, and I just wanted to know, where did you get this remarkable drive? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying that to be disingenuous. I, I really don't know where it came from. Uh, you know, my father was a, a special hearings officer for the Immigration Service, and he, he put it a nine-to-five day. Uh, <laughs> he was home for dinner every night. Uh, my mother gave up her career in show business where she'd been singing since she was a teenager in nightclubs and then did Broadway show and, and she gave that up. So uh, I had like a normal upbringing, normal suburban upbringing. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an official baby boomer. I was born in 1950. <laughs> so I, I don't know where this all derived from. It does sound like part of it was having a solid support system though oh yes i mean support i had i mean in in, uh, in vast uh, quantities my parents were very encouraging and uh you know they uh, you know they gave me the backup i needed but they did not push me into any of this they did not steer me into any of this in fact uh people used to think once i started having some success that uh i uh that they may have made me a film buff. And I said, no, I made them film buffs. <laughs> so it's, 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 I mean, I think that maybe that's the answer then. Um, and that's lucky and, and you write about being lucky and I don't dispute that, but it does seem like a lot of your luck was the result of showing up and doing the work. Like the, the articles led to taking on a magazine, led to the movie All guide. The are true. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when opportunity knocks, you have to answer and you know, walk through the door. You know, when uh, uh, it, when given an opportunity, you have to be able to deliver the goods. Yes. All of those things are true. So that makes me wonder, did you ever have a job that was just a job? Uh, never a full-time job. One summer, uh, I delivered phone books <laughs> with the <laughs> And, and, and that's getting outside, at least. <laughs> well, it, in the, I feel like it, when you moved to L.A. and you got on TV, it kind of went to a, a different level for you from being this starstruck kid going out and, and meeting people to being, you know, and maybe you'll dispute this classification, but a star yourself where you're going to these posh events and Fred Astaire recognizes you. How did that or did it affect your interview style at all? Well, I never thought of myself as a celebrity, and I still don't. I mean, I understand that I've been on TV a long time. People do recognize me, you know, from time to time. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not the star. I'm. I'm out there, you know, uh, like big game hunting for stars. <laughs> But did that recognition affect your work at all as far as is them maybe letting down their guard a little? Or did they still seem that they did in the past before you were better known? No, I don't think that had a... I mean, if, if it gave me an edge or, or a leg up, it was only because uh, they, if they'd seen me on, on television, they knew I was not uh, going to pounce. I was not going to attack. There's a or certain you sneak questions. There's a certain level of yeah. They they know how you how how you operate basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, some of these yeah. some of these interviews, you talk about like the Robert Mitchum interview, where he's got this block of weed and 
He's talking about Sarah Miles, how she's a brilliant actress, but unsavory. I don't, ha is this just an unusual time or person? Do people interview like that anymore in that, in that kind of frank, you know, open way? That was a unique, and I do mean the word unique situation. Yes. It, was, uh, it was not a personal one-on-one -on -one interview. Yeah. It was a press conference for college uh, student newspapers. Yeah. And uh, I w went to NYU and I became the entertainment editor of the daily paper there. And uh, I got a call from a publicist at MGM asking if I wanted to come and talk to Robert Mitchum, uh, who was going to be promoting the David Lean films, uh, you know, Ryan's Daughter. Yes. They didn't have very many interesting questions to ask. You had that advantage of experience there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you didn't write that much about your NYU experience in the book. Was there just not a lot to tell or? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I, uh, <laughs> I applied to two schools. I applied to NYU and Columbia University. <laughs> Columbia said no. NYU said yes. So. End of story. <laughs> Uh, and when I got there, of course, I immediately went to check out uh, the newspaper, which was then called Washington Square Journal. And uh, I asked if they wanted any movie reviews. And editors said, sure, you know, uh, submit a couple. And, and on the, the paper, it's a pretty professional paper at, at, at that time. We, did, we published Monday through Thursday. And, um, and then I, I, I was named the entertainment editor. And I remained that for the, the remainder of my four years stint there. So you did get some solid experience, like practical experience. Well, the, the best part of that is that the entire, I was a journalism major. And all of the journalism cor courses were taught by professional working journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing theoretical about it. And in fact, I was already starting to sell some freelance articles. And they let me turn those articles in as assignments. Now, not every school or department of the school lets you do that. Uh, I know plenty of people who, who said, uh, told me experiences where the professor said, and they didn't take that attitude because they were, they were working journalists and they understood that, you know, I was uh, just one step ahead. Which is precisely what a school should be. Mm -hmm, I think so. Yes. And the experiences that they shared with us uh, life experiences, work experiences, money couldn't buy. Yes. Again, uh, boots on the ground, absolutely, uh, uh, they called them war stories. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, things that, things that you don't find in a textbook. Yes, yes. So, abruptly going back on the interviews, I there's a lot of gold in this book as far as the interviews that you included. Was there anything good that you had to, to cut out? Well, yes. In the, I just did an anthology two years ago, same publisher, called Hooked on Hollywood, a number of other interviews. So, um, fortunately, I have a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, this book coming out, I actually thought that I had caught a lot of your story. And hooked on Hollywood, and I thought, well, what is he going to be sharing here? And the thing that really moved me about this particular book was that this was more of the personal side of things, and yeah. and, and and it really, you know, I I, I follow Jesse on Instagram. I I listen to your podcast. I know about the tightness of your family unit, how you are, as you called it, um, the Malton Empire, and I did very clearly get how Alice influenced and enabled so much of what you were able to do early in your career. But I was curious to know more about how things changed when you and Jessie started to work together more. Well, she, first off, she opened, opened my eyes to uh, a lot of opportunities and avenues that I didn't know about because I am not a social media person. Mm. Uh, I'm not an unsocial media person person but uh i i don't have time or interest to to you know get go down that rabbit hole which for many people is you know a part of their daily uh, daily habit now um 
So Jessie opened me up to that. And, um, and also she's of a different generation. So she's aware of people and trends that, uh, that might be, uh, you know, might be unknown to me. So, uh, and, uh, how has she helped me in every way? And, and of course she's kind of prodded me to, mm -hmm. to stay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, the thing I like about your interplay on your podcast, Malton on Movies, is that she is of this, you know, a newer generation, but she knows so much about the history of films as well. So when you've got somebody like Norman Lloyd on, you know, she, she, she knows where he's coming from and she understands the weight of it all, how important it all is. Yes. Yes. She, she has, she has taken that in, I guess, by osmosis. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not that I educated her about uh, this or that in particular, but uh, along the way, you know, this is the life that I lead and our friends are all uh, of the same, same stripe. And uh, so she's taken a lot in. She's been a sponge, yeah. even, even if un unwittingly. Yeah. Well, I, and I've thought about that. I, I know you're going to be a grandparent very soon and con congratulations by the way, on that. I'm thinking this kid, even if they rebel and become into soccer or something, they're going to know everything about silent movies. And <laughs> they, they... Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> a, good, a good cultural base, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. So with this, with this podcast you're doing, do you have any, any dream guests that, that, that you would like to interview in future? Oh, so, so many. Uh, you know, we, at first... We limited ourselves to people we could interview in person mm -hmm. because we really liked the idea of being in a studio face to face with, with our guests. And then when the pandemic came along and we were forced to use Zoom, which of course offers great convenience yeah. and great geographical access. Uh, so we've gotten accustomed to that. Well, now, you know, the world is available technically. Mm -hmm. um, so, anybody who's alive and interesting, <laughs> I'd love to have on the show. <laughs> alive and interesting. That's a, that's a, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> you know, at at a certain point reading the book, I I wondered if you ever still got starstruck. But then I run right into this Mel Brooks interview where you were really quite moved by the experience, and um, I just find it so interesting that you're still this 13 year old fan in so many ways that it stayed so fresh for you. Do you have any theory into why this is so? Is it just that you've done what you loved your whole life? Well, that's a big part of the answer. But in, in the case of Mel Brooks, I have been uh, uh, following him avidly since I was 12 years old. Yeah. And I first encountered his voice in short called The Critic. And it was right around that time that he and Carl Reiner started doing their 2000 year old man routines on TV and, uh, and on, uh, comedy albums, which were a big deal back in the sixties. And so that's how long I have been an ardent admirer. And, uh, mm -hmm. though I had met him before to sit with him for an extended period of time with my daughter and we were sort of huddled together. Uh, in what was not a professional recording studio, so we all had to kind of try to squeeze together, was just uh, breathtaking. Yeah. I, I like the detail of him holding Jesse's hand, too. It said so much about his kindness. Yeah. And that, you know, as impressive as he is, he's also just this nice man. Yes, and a father and a grandfather. Yeah, just a caring person. So it's like you get starstruck, but they're just like us too. So I wanted to um, ask you about the Walt Disney Treasures collection. I, I was thinking about this and how, you know, maybe I've got my timeline wrong, but it seems like maybe you kind of pushed for this idea of collecting Blu-rays, of there being a collector's audience. Do you feel that's accurate? That's how I pitched it. Yeah. I pitched the idea to the man who ran the company at the time. And I said, the beauty of this is that 
uh, putting out your old cartoons and TV shows and, and certain movies in, in a, an organized way mm -hmm. doesn't repel families or kids from just popping in the disc and watching it and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. What it does is add, broaden that audience. My idea, I felt, didn't exclude families and kids just popping in the disc and enjoying it. Mm. Uh, but you also, this way, uh, beckoned in the, uh, the collectors and the buffs and the diehards. I know that ended rather abruptly. Was there anything else that you had wanted to do for that collection that you were unable to do? I'm sure there's a lot, actually, but anything in particular? Well, fortunately, I think we covered uh, an awful lot of ground, and there's very little that I felt cheated out of doing. I wanted to do a, a set on Disney educational films mm -hmm. because uh, when I was a kid and they used to wheel in the 16 millimeter projector into the room and they put on, you know, historical film, if it had the Disney logo, I perked up. I knew that was going to be entertaining. They, could, they were going to put that spoonful of sugar uh, on the contents. And um, I, I, I hope it still signifies that. For, for today's young audience. And that would have been fun to do. And uh, there was some miscellany. Not too much that we didn't get to cover at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. I was impressed you got that whole season. Of... Was it the whole run of Zorro that you got on the oh, disc? Yes, yes every, every inch. Yeah. That's, that's really something. I, I, I mean, I just... I feel like things have changed so much. I wonder if that would be possible in any way through any company anymore. I know that Walt Disney, this reputation has had a lot of ups and downs over the years. And you were notably saying, you know, trying to give him some support in your book. I I admit that I thought that he had a bad record with, with female animators until I read this book, um, Queens of Animation, realized he was actually remarkably supportive um what what kinds of things do you try to tell people about Walt Disney to 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 kind of be accurate and fair to his reputation well you know I try to set some things straight uh people love to take a pin and prick it in a uh, to mix a metaphor <laughs> uh, a balloon that's a sacred cow uh, you know, bring somebody down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have an opposite attraction toward Disney because I grew up with them, not just from reading, but from talking to people who were actually there. Uh, the more I, I see him as a, uh, uh, as a man of great understanding, he had tremendous people skills. Uh, he, he would reassign people to new projects uh, that they didn't think they could do, but he did. Yeah. He had a, 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 an almost sixth sense about that. Uh, and uh, listen, he was a product of his time. Mm -hmm. and that time was not very enlightened uh, in terms of women in the workplace. But his sister-in-law ran the ink and paint department. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and he, he didn't, and, and Mary Blair, one of the most gifted artists, he ever employed uh, had sort of uh, carte blanche because he just loved what she what she painted. In a way, Mary Blair is my favorite uh, my favorite aspect of, of of who he supported and encouraged. Yeah, yes, exactly. Because he saw the raw talent, and that was I really think that's all he saw. It, it, it wasn't raw; it was already fully developed. Now that's true. Yes, yes, she had a style and. And, and she was influencing them, too. Right. Yeah. Just, her work appealed to him. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Just looking back, what what do you find the most glorious or impressive about what you've done? Like, what's the thing that really warms your heart to think about it? Well, so many things. Uh, but that, uh, getting to release those 37 discs or di two disc sets on DVD. Yeah made so many people happy. And I know because I keep hearing from them all. And uh, that ended uh, 11 or 12 years ago. 
and people still talk to me about it and write to me about it. Yeah. So it's had a, a, you know, a long lasting effect and that's especially rewarding. Yeah. You know, I, another thing about your whole, whole Disney experience, it's really interesting how it's been with you in so many stages through your whole life. The first thing you see is the end of Snow White. That's the yeah. first thing you see in a the theater. And um, just being an honorary member of the Mickey Mouse Club, it seems like the one through line through your life is, is, is Disney. Yeah. Yeah. So in your experience as a USC professor, I, I was so impressed that you managed to fold in these classic stars and, and introduce them to a younger audience. And, and I was tearing up reading the part about Angela Lansbury, and I couldn't figure out why until I realized she was getting her flowers, much in the way that TCM and TCM Film Festival does for, for stars of another era, but also you were showing them her past, showing them another aspect of her, where she came from, and, and the, a younger generation taking that in is going to share it with, with say, their kids. That, that, would be, that would be my fondest wish. So, that said, are you going to continue to try to add those vintage elements to the class? Well, I still show, I'm still teaching that class. Yeah. And I still show a vintage short subject, live action or animated, uh, every week uh, before the brand new feature film. And it's my way of just uh, sprinkling like Johnny Hatt there that I hope will, will bear fruit. Yeah, yeah. And what's the response been to the shorts? Because I know, I feel like they're, a, a student, a young student might be more open to shorts because they're watching all of these things on YouTube and TikTok. Well, uh, I can't give you a detailed answer because we don't have enough time to really discuss them. Mm -hmm. uh, I barely have time to show them given that the feature films run so long nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I hope that they, they derive, if not something immediate from them, that it kind of finds its way into their cranium so that someday maybe when they're watching a film uh, or walking through the room where the film is playing for their parents uh, and they see somebody familiar, they think, oh, I've seen him, right? Or, it's an animated short that they, they can relate that to something contemporary. Mm hmm Yeah, make those connections. And and that's really, you need that true, true education, as I've noticed. Like, the good critics today have that grounding, have that background. Mm -hmm. They know where things come from. So they know not to be too impressed by one thing, but they know how to understand another thing. I know that you've probably been asked this a lot, but but what is your take on, on streaming See me, it seems like streaming is going to exist alongside the theater experience as far as release dates and such. Um, what's your take been on that? I mean, how do you feel about that? I'm adjusting like, like everybody else. At one time, uh, I would have made it my last resort, you know, my, my, my last choice of airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, unless it's a film of grand scale and sweep, uh, I find that, uh, well, after a year and a half mm -hmm. doing this with, with, without having a choice to do otherwise, uh, I find I'm, I'm, I'm adjusting and maybe yes. even getting a little lazy. Yes. It, it becomes quite luxurious at a certain point, <laughs> but yeah. I do agree there's nothing that, that matches that experience. And you've been back in the theater, is that correct? I'm teaching my class in, in the theater at USC. Oh, you're back in the classroom, even. Oh yes, this, as of this uh, this fall. Oh, okay. The students are all masked, but they're there. Yeah, it makes all the difference, I'm sure too. So before I let you go, I I, I think that you signed a, a lot of books, copies of your new book for the oh, yeah, Larry Edmonds the Larry Edmonds Bookshop, which I hadn't which I hadn't been to in a little while. It was just so cool to be in that uh, in that store again. Oh yes, I, I visited on my very first trip to Los Angeles. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. Was it a, was it in that location? I can't remember when it moved. 
Yeah, I can't either because they're, it moved just a little bit on the boulevard, Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, but uh, a room full of books and movie stills and posters, there's a room full of books and movie stills and posters. <laughs> Doesn't matter where it is. Well, I just wanted to make people sure people knew that because I know that um, it, it's been a struggle for them to move forward past these past 18 months. And I think that it would be really special to have a signed copy of your book. So I just want to suggest that to listeners that the Larry Edmonds Bookshop is online and and you can you can order a copy with a signature through them. Personalized. Personalized even. Wow. Um. Thank you so much, Mr. Malton, for talking to me today. You know, I've, I've followed you for years. You know, have some really old copies of your classic movie guide, and and, and you've been just a wonderful movie friend <laughs> throughout the years. Well, that's very kind of you to say, and I I, I feel I've always felt uh, fortunate that I've had this kind of connection with my with my readers and fellow movie buffs. It's a priceless it's a priceless gift, I'm sure. It is. For show notes, including more information about Mr. Malton's book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Coover, watching classic movies. Until next time.